So let's now go over kind of the tools of the trade and the things that I use that are, um, I feel necessary to start training animals. Um, just a simple stick, a twitch or a, a, this is a tree branch that gets them used to one of the command inputs, which is touch. So if I want them to come up, tap them on the rear end, whoa, forehead, G on the left shoulder, haw on the right shoulder, back um, on the ground or on the knees, and we'll show you that. And then you can get more complex as things go along. The most important two things to train calves, it's not a stick, okay, this isn't important. You could use your fingers and you'll see that sometimes you have to touch the animals when you're training them. Two most important things, one is your voice. Consistent, clear commands, Wo means stop, haw means left, G means right, come up or get up come means to move forward and you're doing that consistently. You're not switching it up. Not one day it's not come up and then it's get up and then it's go forward. You pick one and you use it so that you don't confuse the calves. Ah. Easy. Come up. Come up. Come up. Why? Come up. Come up. And you give them time to think about the command before you ever reinforce it. So we'll talk about that. The second most important thing is time. So what does the training routine look like? If you think you're going to get calves that are a week old and then train them effectively, but you only spend, you know, three or four training sessions a week with them, it ain't gonna work out. Um, if you don't have the time to train calves, get animals that are already trained and a little bit older. You can definitely teach them new things and new skills, but a good way to get frustrated with yourself and to get discouraged and turned off is to get calves and not be able to spend enough time with them. So what does that time look like? Training sessions are between two and four times a day, no more than 15 minutes a piece for at least the first month. I'm not even going to think to put them in a yoke until I'm comfortable that they've, they haven't mastered the commands, but they at least understand what I'm trying to do. Uh, and it's hard to say, you can't put a time frame on that. Sometimes that might be a few weeks, uh, it might be a month or two. I don't put them in a yoke um, until individually I'm working with them and comfortable with them. So your voice, your time, those are the two most important tools. A stick and then uh, a lead. So the first thing that I did with these guys is we put them on a collar and we showed you the barn that they're in and we tied them up. I deal with a lot of Teamsters and I've judged a lot over the past 20 years and, and been involved in that aspect of observation, which I think is super important. The number one thing that holds Teamsters back with having handy animals that uh, will do what you want them to do is the reliance on halters. These animals will never be on a halter unless there's two things going on. One is the vet is here and needs to work on them and I need to restrain them or if, if they're in a trailer and I'm transporting them because it's safer. Beyond that, they'll never be on a halter. And the reason for that is it's counterintuitive. Um, halters give you too much control over the animal and I'm gonna show you that. We are not halter training calves for working steers and oxen. We're training them with voice command. And if you're dealing with, and I see a, a, lot, a lot of folks, you know, they have older animals um, and they're still reliant on halters, it's because you've trained one of the command inputs to be the halter. So they may not stop when you want them to stop until they feel you tug on the halter. They may not turn haw or gee until you tug on the halter. But if you start right from the beginning with these guys, by not relying on that halter, it speeds up the process in my opinion. The only reason you have a, a lead on them is to keep them near you. It's not a training input or a command input, and that's really hard. You'll see me when I do it, these guys, I want to pull, I want to tug on them and stop them. And you have to be conscious not to do that. You've got to talk to them and convince them to be driven a certain way without that halter. I know some of the best Teamsters that I've ever dealt with that frankly are, are better than I am that train their calves on halters, but you have to know what you're doing. Um, in order to do that because it can, like I said, it can slow you down. Now, just to give you another perspective, I got the halter on him and I wanna show you kind of the, counter, well, again, the counterintuitive things that can happen. Um, 
it actually, like I said, it gives you too much control. So if I have a collar on him with a lead, I'm forced to make him uh, turn or stop using my voice and reinforcement with a stick or touch as well, uh, which if you haven't seen, we'll, we'll show you um, here in a few minutes. It's very easy to halter break a, a calf or to halter train him. If I want him to come up, I just tug on him and he comes up. Whoa, whoa. And if I want him to turn, okay, let me just pull on him because I'm pulling his head and he turns. This is why I say that it slows you down in the training process because what ends up happening is you're relying on the halter for the primary command input. It's almost like having a, a bridle on a horse and a bit. Our intention is not to train him by pulling his head one way or the other. And he will act completely different, as you'll see, in a collar and a lead compared to a halter. Now I can train him in a halter, it's just I have to be really careful and keep this loose all the time. So if I give him a command, come up, come up, come up, come up, whoa, 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 okay. Now if I have a collar on him, come up, whoa, whoa, that collar is just going to keep him in, in place. It's not going to twist his head or turn him. So it actually makes it a little harder in the sense to train them with a the collar because you're forcing them to listen to your voice. So again, I can't stress enough, this is the single biggest thing that I see that slows down Teamsters. If you're going to use a halter, you've got to keep it slacked all the time uh, or as much as you can. If you use a collar, all you're doing is restraining them close to you. You're not turning their head. The other thing to keep in mind is a lot of folks that get into working steers and oxen and want to tra train calves um, have some level of experience with dairy or beef cattle. And when you show a dairy or beef cow, you've got them on a halter and you're holding them really close to the halter and you're training them to lead on the halter, okay? That's not how we want to do it or how I would recommend doing it with a calf that's being trained for working steer again because we're halter training them and we're not going to halter train them in order for them to be handy. So six months from now or a year from now, if you want to be versatile in where you're um, position to drive them if you want to sit on a cart or, or drive a plow and you've halter trained them then that's going to slow you down you almost have to retrain them because you want the primary command input to be voice secondary is just reinforcement with the stick the best thing if you have older animals too that you're just you haven't built that level of trust they're not listening to voice commands sometimes it's to put them in a confined area in a fenced in area and throw away the halters and work with them on voice commands one step at a time and after a few days or a few weeks they'll get it but you have to be consistent and you can't you really can't rely on the halter in order to do that. Mm -hmm.